everybody, thanks very much for coming along. Uh, I'm Ben. I work for Shine Solutions. We're a consultancy building software for or helping enterprises build software. The usual shtick. <laughs> um, uh, so who here is a React developer or has worked with React? Okay, has anyone done any work with React Native? Okay, this is interesting. Um, when React Native first came out, a lot of our clients got really, really excited um, about the, the prospects um, or the possibility of sharing code between native apps and web apps. And uh, one of our clients, Sportsbet, actually um, had a legitimate reason to be excited. And for the last couple of years, it is literally been a couple of years now, I've sort of had the privilege of working on a, a project internally there um, using React and React Native. And I'm just going to kind of talk about some of our experiences uh, that we've had out there. And the way in which we're going to do this is, I'll start just by giving you a quick overview of the apps uh, that they've sort of replatformed. Um, and then I'm going to get into what's the same, you know, what code is shared between the two platforms. I'm going to go pretty deep. We're going to get down to some, kind of the source code level. Um, then I'll kind of get into uh, what's different, you know, what's, what's, uh, what, what, where do we choose to draw the line when it came to reuse? And that's going to cover things like styling and animations and even um, stuff that affects the relates to the user experience, like um, transitions and things like that. And then kind of, again, we'll be pretty down and dirty then, but then we'll come up for air at the end. And I'm actually going to kind of do a more high level overview of one thing that lots of people neglect to um, uh, think about very much when they start projects like this, and that, that is what's kind of the developer experience going to be for our team? Because, you know, they have like, they might, there's at least 25 devs working on this project at the moment. And getting them all up to speed with this complex stack is, um, is not a trivial thing, and having them all pointing sort of in the right direction, it's, you know, it's not a trivial thing. All right, so let's talk about the apps. Uh, so if you don't know them, sports bet are basically like an online bookie. Um, so if you want to place bets on horses or dogs or trots or sports or politics maybe or I don't know, two flies crawling up a wall. They've probably got a market for it. Um, and it's all online. So they have a native iOS app um, that's built with Objective-C, and a lot of their revenue actually comes through the, through the native app. But they're getting, a bit, they're getting a bit tired of this code base, and Objective-C in particular. They experimented with Swift, um, but the transition from Swift 2 to Swift 3 was really painful for them, and they were not sure that it was a good good platform to continue with. Sportsbit also have a mobile web app built using JavaScript, um, and it uses Backbone, JS. And um, they also have a desktop site, and that's written with um, Tickle. So has anyone here ever developed with Tickle? Does anyone here know what Tickle is? Well, exactly, that was their problem. Um, it's, they, no one could really work on it anymore because um, there wasn't really that many people around with the skills to, to build. Um, and also, this is a, actually, these are really complex apps. Like, of all the apps that I've worked on for different clients, this is probably one of the most, or different customers, this is probably one of the most um, sophisticated client-side apps I've ever worked on, because there's lots of really complex business lo logic relating to um, uh, bets and bet placement and bet combinations and all sorts of different permutations. And they were getting sick of having to re-implement new features across all of these platforms every time they wanted to add something. Um, you know, on the plus side, they did have feature teams. So they didn't have teams siloed by platform, which was great. They had feature teams, but still each feature team had to have an iOS developer who would be working exclusively with Objective-C. And it would have a couple of web developers, you know, who would be working exclusively with JavaScript. And no one could really do desktop anymore anyway. Everything was kind of grinding to a halt on that front because almost nobody could work with it. Um, so they got sick of having to write the same code over and over again. They got sick of having to implement features in parallel. And so um, React and React Native, the prospect of being able to um, share this complex business logic between clients while still being able to have a good web experience and potentially a good um, native iOS experience was really compelling to them. And so they took a run at it. And overall, I'd say the experience has been pretty good so far. So in production now, we have um, uh, React Native components, components embedded inside the current iOS app. We have React, Native, uh, React components for this project embedded inside the current mobile web app. 
We have a full responsive website that is at new.sportsbet.com.au that we're just ironing the kinks out from and soon they're going to switch that across to the new domain at www.sportsbet.com.au and they're working on um, uh, getting the full iOS app shifted across to React Native right now. Um, yeah, it's going quite well for them. So in sort of demonstrating how much code uh, they've been able to reuse and sort of the patterns that we've used to do it, I'm kind of use this example of this thing that they have, or a screen they have called MultiBuilder. And MultiBuilder is kind of this um, tool that has, that allows people to assemble combinations of bets on sports. So here's the kind of the, re the web version on the left. Um, and so I'm just kind of, this is soccer matches and I'm just, selecting winners to place a, place multiple bets. And you can see the odds being recalculated down here. So, you know, right now for every dollar I put in, if, if all of those teams won, I'm gonna get almost $2,000 back for each dollar I put in. Um, there's a little bit of animation there and transitions, you know, it's, it's not too bad. That's the web. And then here's iOS running as well. Now this is an older version of the iOS app, so the animations aren't running at this point, but it's the same kind of deal really. And the cool part about this is that um, all of the business logic behind this is the same. Um, and it's all built actually from one project. But this is, this is a native iOS app. It's not like a web viewer or anything like that in running um, on an iPhone. It's actually a native iOS app with native iOS components and as a consequence, you know, good, well-performing animations and so on. And that is, of course, a web app. So if we were to break it down, um, almost half of the code is, is common. Uh, and I'm going to now kind of describe to you how we achieve that. And, and this sort of pattern has scaled out to the rest of the app. But we'll use MultiBuilder as, as an example of you know, what's the same. Um, so has anyone here? OK, so the way, the way in, in summary, when, when I talk about business logic being common, I mean we're using Redux. So people here use Redux at all, familiar with the concepts? So in, in Redux, we use all the same action creators and we use all of the same reducers, and we also use all of the same container components. Um, pe people know much about the container presentation pattern. Is that kind of, oh, okay, I'll start from the, you know, I'll start from fundamentals with it. So these days building UIs, we really do focus on components. You know, that's been behind the real sort of revolution in the way that we, I certainly know the way that we build web applications. Um, that um, a unit of encapsulation is a really powerful one and React, I think was actually probably the first um, library to really have components first and foremost, you know, sort of in its in its model. Uh, the container presenter pattern is where each thing on your screen actually has two parts. So we're kind of decoupling components into two parts. We split them into two subcomponents. Um, one we call the container component, and that contains all of the business logic relating to that component. And the other part is what we call the presenter component. And that's really just the view-based stuff. And so the, it really, the presenter component is just like a template. You know, in React, it happens to be JavaScript, but if you were using some other framework, it'd just be, it could be an HTML template or if you're using Angular or Vue or whatever. But it's really just, it's, it's very dumb, okay? And all that it does is have a set of props passed into it from the container component, and those props comprise two parts. Sort of the data that that um, component is to display, that presenter component is to display, and also any callbacks that that presenter component can invoke when the user does something, like click something inside the container, uh, click something inside the, uh, on the screen or inside the component. And those callbacks go back up to the container component where it is responsible for processing them and whatever. And in the case of using a Redux store, um, the container component is actually responsible for sort of um, receiving notifications fundamentally about what the current state of the application is in extracting the data needed for this particular component. And then when a callback is invoked back into the container by the presenter, um, it will dispatch an action to the Redux store. But to be clear, the container um, presenter component pattern doesn't actually require Redux, okay? All of the state management and um, uh, sort of uh, pr processing of state could actually be done in the container. And sometimes I've done that in other projects using um, React's built-in state or whatever. But in this case, we, we did actually use Redux because it, it was a pretty big project. So just to be clear about what this kind of stuff looks like, if we look at kind of the web presenter, uh, this is it here. Um, I'm just, to kind of keep, because there's a bit of code on the screen there, I'm, I'm using what's called a, a stateless functional component. Um, that's actually a component that is just a function, because all it does is take some input, i.e. some props, and just return sort of a little element 
hierarchy. Okay, it doesn't actually have any state of its own. It's just a function that gets run over and over again as the app executes. Um, so we've got here just the title at the top, you know, in this, in this JSX that's being returned from the component. Um, we're then going to iterate over some, sport, some sports that have been injected into the component. And for each of them, we're going to display the sport name just here. And then we've got some, a little bit of logic here that says, well, if the, if the sport um, matches the one that's been selected, I, we've been also been notified about which sport's been selected, then we're going to alter the styling of it. If, you know, if uh, this um, element gets clicked, then we're going to invoke this callback that goes back out to the container. And also we've got some logic down here. You know, we've got these, these things are called markets, so these are different sorts of um, types of bets that you can place on a particular sport. Um, we're just saying, well, you know, if, if there is currently a selected sport, because maybe there isn't one, uh, we'll display the markets available for that sport, otherwise we just won't display anything. So that's what the presenter looks like. Uh, um, the container, and this is kind of quite Redux specific code, but just to give you the general gist of it, we're using the React Redux bridge and um, using a function called connect, which is what's called a higher order component. Um, and it, it takes, it wraps the presenter and, and produces what is called the container. Now, automatically wires this um, logic, in, wires this presenter component to the Redux store. And in this case, there's two functions that it takes, one called map state to props, where it gets the Redux state and just gets the variables out of it that it needs. Um, and then map, one called map dispatch to props, which is for handling um, actions that come into the presenter and then mapping those to the uh, actions that are dispatched to the store. So that's roughly kind of what a, a, a presenter and a container look like. And you'll also have noticed in the previous slide that the container is actually the thing that you drop onto the page. So the, the container contains the presenter inside of it. Okay? And presenters can actually render, um, if they have subcomponents within them, uh, they'll render the container. And then that container will render its own presenter and so on down the tree. And it's, uh, it's important, the reason that I'm sort of being explicit about that is we'll get back to in a second. All right, so this is a really great pattern because it sort of enables you to split these two things apart, helps with testability and just avoiding spaghetti code. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that this has got some cross-platform potential because um, you can have one container and uh, two possible presenters for it, one for use on iOS and one for use on web. And this is actually fundamentally the pattern that we've used for the app. Um, but then the question is, well, if, if, a, if the container is the thing that gets rendered, how do we say, oh, we want you to render, in this context, an iOS presenter, and in that context, a web presenter? And React being React, um, it's actually quite easy to, to just make it that a component is uh, a, a, a prop that's passed into the container. So we can say, hey, I want to render the multi-builder container, and I want it to use this presenter. Okay? And we can do that for, I, for uh, web, and we can do it for iOS as well. One thing to keep in mind, though, is that um, there's this weird sort of, when, I, when we first started talking about this, we had this weird kind of chicken and the egg situation, because we were like, OK, well, what decides sort of the presenters for the next layer down? Because there are lots of layers in this app, you know? If we consider multi-builder, at the very top level, there is this multi-builder component. And then we've got this markets component that we talked about just before. Then there's events, an events list displayed under that, displaying all these different sporting events, for example. Um, that list contains rows, each row con contains buttons. How do we kind of model this and how do we make sure, how do we reuse containers but have it that the web version of each component gets used all the way down and in, in, on the web and that the iOS version gets used all the way down in the native app? And the short answer is that um, a parent presenter can reuse a container but it can um, say which uh, child presenter it wants to use and it can say, I want to use the web version. And, and an iOS presenter can say, I'm going to use the, this container and I want you to use an iOS version of the presenter. So in short, um, we start at the top with a multi-builder container and it you know, renders a multi-builder web presenter internally. The multi-builder web presenter uh, renders a markets container and tells it to use a markets web presenter. The events, it also renders an events list container and that it tells it to use an events list web presenter. And this chain can work all the way down through the tree. And so for iOS, we can reuse the same containers, except in this case, the multi-builder iOS pre presenter says, I want to just use the markets container, but with the markets iOS presenter. 
and the outcomes list can, and I want to use the outcomes list container with the outcomes list iOS presenter. So each red box gets to decide the type of the next red box down, but they're all reusing the same blue boxes, the same containers. And just to be really explicit, in case you're still a little bit confused, relating it to the code we saw before. At the top level, we have this multi-builder container. It gets a presenter prop that is the multi-builder web presenter. The web presenter renders a couple of containers and parameterizes them with the, the appropriate web presenters. And again, all the way down the tree. Um, but we do have a little bit of logic in here, for example, where we've got multiple rows, um, multiple event rows, and we're going to iterate over them and display a container each time. Containers can also take additional properties too. For example, you know, what the ID of this particular event is. Um, or, you know, if we've got a couple of buttons relating to different potential outcomes on, a, on, a, uh, on an event, we can do that as well and iterate over those. And then similarly with iOS, we do the same kind of thing, except in this case it nominates to use the iOS presenter with, all, with each container down the tree. Containers are reused and presenters are platform specific. And basically it's container presenter pattern all the way down throughout. We've got a, about 150,000 lines of code now and this is the dominant pattern throughout our entire application. But um, some of you may have looked at that and gone, well, in some of that code, I could see that you had, you were iterating over sports, like in two different places. You know, in the web presenter, you iterated over the sports to render a little container each time, and in the iOS one, you, you were doing the same. Isn't that duplicated code? And you would be right. Um, and if you know, I'm not sure if you know much about uh, the React Native ecosystem, but you can actually take this reuse further, but we didn't. So there is, Microsoft have a, a, a framework called React XP, for example, or there's an open source, another uh, open source framework called React Native Web that aims to unify at the component level. So uh, in React Native, you know, you have views, and in, you know, in the web, in the DOM, you have divs, and in React Native, you have text objects, and on the web, you have spans, okay? Um, React Native Web or React XP actually unify them into a single markup. So views um, are transformed into divs or React Native views depending upon the platform that you're on. But we decided not to do that. And the reason for that is, um, well, I'm going to talk about it now, and we'll just categorize it broadly under what's, what's different. You know, what's different between these, these platforms? Here's the first thing. The styling is different, okay? So... If we consider web, consider this little outcome button here. Um, the markup for the presenter, or the code for the presenter looks a bit like this. We have uh, this stateless functional component, and most importantly, um, we've just got a regular div and we specify a class name on it. Uh, the, the class names are sort of pulled out of an object, a style sheet object here. We do, we do it again here and here. And this style sheet, in this case, um, is set up using a CSS in JS framework um, called TypeStyle, which is just a CSS in JS framework for, for TypeScript. Um, but, and it could, it could just as well be CSS modules um, or some other CSS framework, but that's just what we chose to do in our case. Um, we do get to describe the CSS using JavaScript. We create an object, and you know we can use things like flexbox and so on, and specify you know flex properties. We can specify background colors, you know, and the, the framework will be responsible for generating a style sheet at runtime, and um, and inserting it into the page. But it, at the end of the day, it's all CSS as web developers know it, and it's also class names. <coughs> iOS works a little bit differently. Um, I guess for starters, the markup's a bit different in this case, um, without using a helper framework like React XP. The markup's a little bit different. We have this thing called a touchable highlight, which comes from React Native. That's kind of for handling touch events. Um, styling, instead of using a class name, we have just have a, a prop here called style that is a, that, um, you know, we can inject arbitrary styles into a view component, which is, you know, great. So we've got some logic here that, you know, displays one style or another depending upon whether the button's selected or not, you know, whatever. Um, React Native has its own built-in sort of style sheet object that you use for assembling what, you know, it calls a style sheet. And this is an interesting decision that the React Native team and not made, and not necessarily a bad one, is that they kind of took the best bits of CSS and sort of ported them to the React Native environment. Um, probably a really good example of that is um, Flexbox. So they ported uh, Flexbox to the RN environment for layout, which is probably a pretty good idea. Plus simple CSS properties like font size and font weight. Um, 
and you, you can sort of do tricks to then override styles and so on, which is, is kind of what's happening here for a selected button style. But the key thing, there's still a key difference here, and that is that um, uh, in, in, on the web, like class names, uh, well, they're class names, they're CSS class names, whereas in Re React Native, it's actually just an object that has a bunch of properties in it, you know? Um, in, on the web, you don't want to be setting styles directly on a component. It's just not very performant. You have to use class names. And the other thing is that if you do want to um, use, if you wanted to unify these together, and these React XP and React Native Web do unify these models together, you have to go to the lowest common denominator, like of, of what's common between the two platforms. And um, web developers in particular don't really like doing that. I mean, CSS, you know, can be pretty nasty and it is what it is, but CS devel uh, web developers want to have the full, C you know, available CSS properties available to them, you know. Um, and that might at first seem a little pedantic, but even for simple stuff like, uh, you know, we have a responsive website, so we need to style responsive breakpoints, and, you know, React Native doesn't support anything like that, okay? In fact, sometimes, frankly, when it comes to building responsive, it's naive to, uh, a responsive website, it's naive to think that you can even um, do everything with CSS. Sometimes you have to have different markup. You know, sometimes on the desktop version of your site, you want extra stuff in the DOM, you know, being displayed to the user, whereas on the mobile version, you don't. And so knowing that, knowing that even our templates might need to be different, we chose to give ourselves that wiggle room. So instead of using a framework like that, we just had different presenters. And sometimes the markup was pretty similar. Sometimes developers starting on their iOS version of a page they'd already done in web would start just by copying and pasting the web version and then starting to just tweak it, change the divs to views and so on. But having that wiggle room was really, really useful for us. And it also was useful from a UX perspective because as developers, we like to come up with generalizations in advance. We like to come up with the guide framework for building UX. Um, but it's almost, it's like a law of nature that UX designers will come up with something that cannot be done with whatever guide framework developers have come up with. It's just like a cat-dog thing. It's just, it's just the way it is, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's their job, you know? Um, and we, we have that at Sportsbed a lot where UX is really, really important. We can't have a lowest common denominator style styling library. The second big difference is animation. So on the web, um, here's a little animation you might have seen on the original video. It's just this little multi-builder box that pops up and down from the bottom. Um, on the web, we did this pretty traditionally using um, uh, CSS styles. So React comes with this sort of, sort of satellite project called React Transition Group that can um, we specify a bunch of styles, including CSS animations, for example, here, and, uh, and then you can apply those styles um, using timings and so on. This is actually an idea that came from Angular originally, and it was sort of ported across to React. And this is a, a, a reasonable way to do animations for the web. It, there are kind of gnarly aspects to it, like, for example, th this timeout here has to be coded to pretty much be the same as that. Otherwise, things can get kind of weird. You can kind of refactor the duplication, but it is a little bit kind of nasty. And it kind of points to there are some inherent mismatches between you know, writing a JavaScript app like this and using CSS to style things like animations. And the reason that I kind of uh, mention that is that an iOS, um, it's actually, th they use a completely different approach to doing animations. So React Native, it, inside it has this, uh, object available called animated, and it's really awesome. And you can have these special animated values that you can uh, apply uh, like easing functions to and so on and, and trigger off transitions of those values. So that's what we're doing here. And then we can have special views that use these special values and it all just works seamlessly across the bridge into the native app. And it's really cool because it's performant, but it's declarative, like the animated um, API is fantastic. In fact, some people have actually ported it back to the web. It's so awesome. But again, you kind of get into this weird um, uncanny valley situation where there are certain animations that are possible on iOS that aren't possible on web and vice versa. So again, you're kind of going for lowest common denominator. And again, UX people will, they still want to think in terms of web and iOS and they will find a way to confound whatever framework that you've decided to use. That was definitely the case for us. Uh, so in our case, we pretty much, again, benefited from having separate presenter components. This is a presenter component that, um, because it has some state of its own, uh, 
isn't a stateless functional component, you know, it is able to take care of its own animations. I mean, personally, I prefer using JavaScript for animations anyway. And even back on the web, like, we use CSS for those ones because it was easy, but, you know, again, if you go with a lowest common denominator framework, you lock yourself out of other more sophisticated JS animation libraries like Greensoft and so on, you know. <coughs> All right, finally, we've got kind of the big one, the big difference between these platforms, and this kind of transcends even technology and, and what coders want to do and reuse, and that is navigation. So navigation on the web is pretty straightforward, so here's a little video of us navigating around the app, the mobile web app. And uh, let's start up the web one. So anyone want to kind of point out some differences in navigation between these? What's some that spring to mind? Sorry? Uh, yeah, that's one of them. We've got a tab bar down the bottom as well. Tab bars are pretty much uh, a well-known paradigm for iOS apps, but web, they're not really a thing. They don't really make sense. And probably most significantly, there were animated transitions there on the iOS app. On the web, users are used to just clicking around, the screen changes, and you know. But on iOS, users are not used to that. You know, they, that's a degradation of their experience. They want really nice transitions from screen to screen. They'll notice if there's not. Even if it's, they're not fully aware of it, they'll notice it. Um, furthermore, these, these animations and transitions, they need to be interactive. Like sometimes you can um, drag to, sw you can swipe across to go forward forward and back inside the stack, and if you let go halfway through, it'll pop back to where it was. Like, there's all these really sophisticated transitions that come out of the box with iOS that web developers just don't have to think about normally. And you can actually do a little bit of animated transitions with web, but people just aren't used to it. And there's a risk that you'll actually just confuse your users, because, you know, if you swipe, you know, they're used to swiping to go back. You know, that's about the extent of navigation on the web, you know, or animated navigations on the web. If you mess with that, you'll just confuse them. That said, there is one thing that um, the web does do better than native, um, and I've sort of, I'll see if anyone can kind of guess it. I've kind of put it out to desktop size to kind of give people a sense. Can you see what sort of the difference is or maybe something important in here that web does better than native? I'll give you a hint. It's sometimes described as the superpower of the web, but it's also something that's so ubiquitous that we just take it for granted these days. The web has links, <laughs> which sounds really obvious, but links are really awesome. Like, you can send them around and deep link, you know, and, and that's a fantastic thing about the web. We take it for granted, but it's fantastic. And iOS, iOS apps actually want links, you know, and they can support links. Uh, you know, there's like universal linking in iOS where you can have it, you can provide a link to the user and they click it, and if the, if the app is registered, um, then it will load the app and go to that place in the app, and if, it, if it's not on their phone or whatever, it just goes to the website. Like, it's a, really, it's a really powerful mechanism. You want to send out emails to users on their phones or notifications with links. Links are really, really important. And I'll just get back to that a little bit in a minute, why, why I've sort of made that emphasis. So when it comes to doing navigation on the web, it's all pretty straightforward. So we use the fantastic React Router framework, um, and React Router code kind of looks a bit like this. So say that we've got a... This is a little video here. We were on the home page and we kind of clicked multi-builder from the menu. That was a link and it took us to multi-builder. So to set this kind of to set this up with React Router, we just bring in some components from that from that library. Um, we declare a, a top-level browser router, and then we just define routes inside of it. Um, and the awesome thing is routes are themselves React components. Uh, so we've got one route here that for you know the root path renders a home web screen. Um, for the multi-builder path, it renders the multi-builder web screen. And these routes can be composed in lots of different ways, just like any other React component. It's fantastic. It's awesome. Um, linking is kind of another thing that we should talk about before we move on to iOS, because that's kind of the way in which you navigate around web apps. You know, we, in, in, With React Router, you have this thing called a link. Um, you can link to anywhere, and you can click, it'll, you know, it'll put a a clickable link in your, on, on the screen and people can click them, that's fantastic. Um, really actually under the hood all it's doing is expanding out to an anchor tag a bit like this um, because, and the reason I'm being clear about this usage is that every, uh, in, the home web screen gets past a set of props so it is embedded inside a React Router route and because of that the React Router React Router passes it a special prop that is actually the history, the history object for the browser. And you can push stuff 
So this is sort of a programmatic way to navigate somewhere in your app. Okay? Functionally, these are basically the same. All right, so let's talk a little bit about iOS. Okay, you're probably going to see in a second some scary, the scariest code in this presentation. We're going to use React Navigation here. Um, for a long time, it was a bit of a running joke within the React Native community, the sheer number of different navigation solutions that there were. But they seem to have kind of coalesced on this one called React Navigation. And React Navigation is good because they have gone to the effort and this considerable effort of reproducing all of the uh, or many of the iOS transitions kind of in React Native in a performant way. And at first, naively, you can think, oh, I'll do that myself. But the, the fact is, I mean, I've, I know people who've done it, and it's literally they're taking high frame rate videos of these transitions on their phone. They're examining them with Lupe's. They're, you know, it takes a lot of effort to reproduce those things. You don't want to do that effort yourself. This, this team has gone to the effort of doing it. However, the, the code can be quite complex to deal with because it's not just a set of routes anymore. It's a whole set of nested navigators. So in this case, um, we're bringing in a couple of objects from that library, or a couple of functions from that library. This sets up um, the tab down here at the bottom, and it puts a couple of uh, uh, pages inside of it, home and multi-builder, each of which has its own stack. Uh, we can you know, set a default. We can override tab images and icons and so on. Um, each stack navigator, which is kind of this portion of the screen here, we can put screens inside of it as well. You notice this is kind of weird because the tabs, there's a home tab and a multi-builder tab, for example, but each tab has um, its own, the same screens repeated in it, and that's kind of necessary to reproduce what users are used to on iOS, which is if you have multiple tabs, they often retain their position, so you basically need multiple versions of the same screen accessible in different tabs. Um, again, you can, you know, this is customizable in a bunch of different ways. This is a complex API. It sort of relies on functions to generate components. Arguably, it's a bit too complicated. I think, you know, they're trying to clear up the API, but it's kind of complex stuff. To navigate around your app, um, for links, we have, for example, if on the iOS home screen you wanted to be able to navigate to Moldy Builder, here's a touchable highlight. Um, it's got a event handler on it. And you can, again, uh, React Navigation injects properties into screens. Um, but at this time, the property is uh, there's this navigation property, and you can kind of push onto that, kind of like with the browser, but also kind of different. And screens are described using strings, but they're not really routes. They call them routes, but they're not routes as web developers know them. So there's all these kind of differences between these, but sort of between the way that you, we link with um, iOS and web. <coughs> But that said, we can kind of unify a lot of this model. Like, it, we, at the end of the day, we have screens. The navigation between screens might be different, but the screens themselves can at least share a lot of business logic. And in fact, we might want to reuse our, we might have a home container with a bunch of logic in it, and we might make it that the iOS screen, which is used with React Navigation, still uses the home container, but internally it uses a different presenter. Um, the web, web screen, which use, is used by React Router, which is an entirely different kind of context, still uses the home container but with a different presenter. You can sort of have this entry. You can have common stuff up until a certain high level point in your app where navigation becomes a thing, where you've got to go beyond screens and actually start thinking about navigation. And the reason that I kind of draw this out explicitly is that um, you need to start, when it comes to certain, fun certain pieces of functionality, for example, linking, you need to have platform specific callbacks. So for example, um, uh, we know that the navigation code differs across platforms. We want to reuse the home container, but we know that this code is different. So one way to deal with this is to have a property that we pass in that has platform-specific behavior. So this is a platform-specific screen. It's had a navigation object passed into it. We're going to have it passed into the container, this navigate to multi-builder function that is responsible for triggering the, the, sort of the, the navigation to multi-builder, you know, along with all of its transitions and so on. Um, and the same thing can happen with web. We can have a home web screen that has this same property, but with a different implementation. In this case, we know that we're being used in the context of React Router. We've got a history object, and therefore we can push a value to it. It's kind of like a, it's like a type of, or it's analogous to polymorphism in object-oriented programming. We've got this function where the implementation differs, and this this essentially constitutes an escape hatch. Um, this is the this is the escape hatch mechanism we we use when we couldn't do stuff in presenters, and in this case we couldn't because, the, because the, um, at least in the case of React Navigation, the navigator needed to be passed down from above. Um, this is the type of escape hatch that we used 
for platform specific behavior because what we really didn't want was to have code that would be scattered throughout our code base that was like, if I'm iOS, do this, and if I'm web, do that, because we do, knew that would just proliferate everywhere. This is a more declarative approach where everything's kind of wired together at the beginning. From a container perspective, um, React Router supports doing this sort of thing. So map dispatch to props gets a second argument called own props, um, and that, that gives access to any additional properties that are provided to the container. So in this case, navigate to multi builders was provided to the container, and it can just convert that to a function that gets passed to the presentation component. So in this case, neither the container nor the component know anything, or the pres presenter know actually that they're on web or whatever. They don't know anything about the mechanism being used for navigation. And we use this for other platform specific things as well. <coughs> All right, so to summarize, what's different? CSS and animations. You can fall into a real uncanny valley trap from both a coding perspective and a usability perspective if you try and unify these models enough. At least that's what we found. Navigation, well, they're completely different paradigms. It's naive to think that you can have exactly the same code because you will degrade the user experience. Finally, the good news is that with a bit of thought, you can give yourself well-structured escape patches for functionality. We found that really important. And I'd like to kind of, I could, you know, end right there. It's all been very technical so far, but there is one more aspect that's been really crucial to this project, and that is the developer experience. Because there's, there's a lot of tech kind of going on here. And plus, we also have, um, you know, at Sportsbet, they had a bunch of web developers and a bunch of iOS developers, and they didn't want them, they didn't want there to be um, uh, much separation between them anymore. They were all one team really working on one platform. Sometimes the app was iOS and sometimes it was web, but they really had feature parity. They didn't want, they didn't want there to be people who were iOS only and people who were web only. And a big part of that was tooling. So I had one question for you, and that is, how might you get a bunch of Objective-C developers, how might you convince a bunch of Objective-C developers to write JavaScript? How might you get a bunch of developers used to a static type system to use a dynamic type system like JavaScript? The answer kind of is, well, you don't actually make them use a dynamic type system. You give them something like TypeScript. And this was a massive thing for the iOS developers because they knew that they would still have types. The flip side of that is that um, a really good way to cheese off a bunch of JavaScript developers is to force them to start using TypeScript. But frankly, it was worth it, not just from the perspective of getting Objective-C developers on board, but the, the size that this code base grew to, um, TypeScript has just become invaluable to, to sort of maintaining consistency across the code base. It's sort of like a medicine that tasted bad at first, even for me, you know, I was a Java developer for 10 years and a JavaScript developer for five years, going to TypeScript seemed like a big pain to me in the end. But now I'm grateful. And whenever I'm on looking at some code that's not using TypeScript, I miss, it, miss TypeScript incredibly. A second part of the tooling was um, recommending, not mandating, but recommending to developers that they use Visual Studio Code. It integrates really well with TypeScript. Objective-C developers loved it because it gave them like uh, completion, code completion out of the box really easily. Not everyone uses it. We have some people who still use IntelliJ and stuff like that, and that's fine. But um, developers knowing that this was available to them and, and they could just start using it and it was going to be pretty, you know, bear some resemblance to what they were used to with Xcode, that was a real selling point. Um, next big sort of uh, significant part of this project was actually the, the build tooling. So who knows what this project is? Any web developer? Yes, Webpack. Uh, so all the web developers were kind of familiar with that in as much as anyone can be familiar with Webpack because it's a beast. Uh, some of you might know this project or this, this product. This is Xcode. So all of the uh, iOS developers were familiar with this. And both of these were kind of crucial to the project. Um, Webpack to assemble the, you know, the final artifact to be deployed for the web and Xcode to assemble the final artifact for iOS. Um, so whilst we... Uh, already had teams with iOS and web developers on them, and we now wanted them all to think in terms of one code base. You know, being realistic, there are still times where someone with a web speciality would need to step in and do a bit of wrangling with Webpack, and someone with, you know, a bit of a um, uh, Xcode background would need to step in and do a bit of wrangling with Xcode. You know, it's just a kind of an inevitability. Here's the last one for you. Does anyone know what this is? This is Metro. So Metro is Facebook's bundler for React Native. 
and Metro is a whole thing in itself. Um, it uses Facebook's internal packaging system, which is called Haste, um, which, for example, uses absolute paths for everything, you know, as opposed to relative paths that we, we're used to using with tools like Webpack. Um, Metro is, uh, well, I mean, put bluntly, on each team, the, the web developers would not really understand Xcode, the uh, iOS developers would not really understand Webpack, but really no one understood Metro. We've got enough of it going to integrate TypeScript with it, but I'd be lying if I said that we've got a real handle on it. And it, things have stabilized now, but part of the problem with a really complex tool chain like this is, and this was one of the initial downsides of TypeScript, um, is that uh, you have to take this very complex chain that's producing you know, a web, a, 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 for one code base, an output for web, an output for iOS, and we wanted to prize apart that tool chain and jam TypeScript into it, and that was quite painful for quite a long time. But I think we've sorted it out now. But I'd be lying if I said Metro is, isn't something that still scares me a little bit. Um, and finally, the third big thing that I think that developers needed to, or we needed to do, or put an effort into with our developers was, I guess we'd call it kind of brain tooling, changing their mindset, because, um, the thing about iOS developers or Objective-C, Cocoa developers, and even like uh, Backbone developers, is they're used to thinking in a particular way about how you write code and how you build an app. They're used to thinking in terms of classes and objects. But if you've used React at all, I mean, I, sometimes I think of React as being kind of like a gateway drug for functional programming. Like React is a very functional, Frame, functional framework. Like we've seen there lots of um, stateless components. They're just a function. It's just a function that takes some props and spits out a little a fragment of the component hierarchy. Um, and a lot of devs we observed over time had a lot of trouble switching to this, especially for what you might call performance anxiety. They would get worried that these functions were getting executed over and over again. It wasn't that going to be a performance problem. And hey, maybe I'll just case a little value here, you know, and no one will notice. But if you do that with React, it can punish you quite severely with really weird bugs basically. So we had a lot of time where people would be putting things in state that they didn't need to, considering React components, for example, putting duplicated values in state or derived values in state, which sounds kind of esoteric, but it's really important that if you're using React, people have got a handle on the fact that you don't do this. Or if you do, um, well, actually, you, you just don't do it, but if you have performance issues, you don't um, store values on objects, you don't store values in state, uh, you memoize at the function level and you optimize certain functions using memoization, um, which is sort of like a you know, performance technique for functional programming, really. Uh, took a long time for people to get their heads around that. And it was the same was true of Redux. The same rules for React apply to Redux. You don't have duplicated state or derived state in your store. Um, also with Redux, uh, things like um, the way in which you uh, do asynchronous programming. Like you've got to make decisions about the way in which you use Redux, and developers can get confused if you haven't made those decisions clear to them. You know, and everyone's writing code in different ways. So the way in which we dealt with that was we put a lot of effort up front into having sort of a boot camp, boot camp um, sort of a setup process where people could could get familiar with this this tool chain and all the different parts of it. You know, TypeScript, Webpack, bit of Xcode, React Native, React. Uh, type style for the styling, you know, how we tested. There was a lot of different bits and pieces to it. They would go through this boot camp, we'd start with really small examples, let them build up little dummy apps from scratch to get a sense for how it all fitted together. Then when they actually came onto the project, it was really important that we just reviewed, reviewed, reviewed. Um, we'd started with a small team of about five, we laid a little foundation with MultiBuilder, then we, um, most of us then went out and became tech, became tech leagues on other teams, and we initially then spent a lot of time reviewing what those teams were doing, which was hard. You know, at one point I spent like half my time reviewing code, but it was worth it because slowly the teams became self-sufficient. They began to understand, you know, you don't cache values on the way, you'll get weird bugs. They began to understand that we're doing async with React this way, or with Redux this way. And an, an adjunct to that was it was really important for us to write general documentation about why we're doing things certain ways and certain things that have caught people out in the past. So that when we were doing a code review and we saw someone doing something that we knew was just going to be a foot gun down the track, we could say, you know, don't do that, do this differently. And they, if they said why, we didn't have to go and explain to them every time. We could just say, just go look at this link. We've written down why we've made these decisions and the problems that we've had in the past. And that was really, really important in scaling this project up to 25 to 30 devs. All right, so let's wrap this up. Um, in short, the container presenter pattern worked for us with this tweak. It was really, really powerful. Um, and it's a consistent pattern that we use all the way through our code bases. But there are 
inevitably differences between the platforms, especially navigation. You've got to think about it from a UX perspective, a dev perspective. There's a while there where uh, we didn't even know how we were going to do, do deep linking. I haven't really gone into it much detail, but we were able to end up doing deep linking with React navigation. It was a little bit tricky, but it was possible. So we can now actually link into this app as well. And finally, developer experience. Um, when using React and React Native, I, I web and native iOS is really important, like getting all of the developers familiar with the tooling and getting all the patterns in place um, understood that they're going and, and understood that they're going to have to get their heads around. Um, otherwise, you know, it can all get pretty messy. But we've been really happy with the results so far. We've achieved the code reuse that we wanted to. Um, the teams are all considering themselves working on one platform. And um, yeah, we're really looking forward to continuing to roll out what's been done so far. Thanks very much. <laughs> any questions? Yep. Can you look at any big differences between the developers of iOS and Portage? Um, let's just wait for the next Do you mean like developer speed? Yeah, developer speed and stuff. Mm, no, not really. Because the next question I was is how would you synchronize? Because you have shared code base mm -hmm. and their specific code bases for different types of things. Yep. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, actually, there is, you know, in terms of code organization, there is only one code base, and our code base hierarchy is structured on components, and there just happens, you know, there'll be, there's a folder called multi builder, and it contains the multi builder container, and it contains the multi builder iOS presenter, and the multi builder web, present, web presenter, and the entire code base is like that, along with all the, you know, related reducers and action creators. So there's not really, I'm sure, the builds um, draw from that tree in different ways. Um, and only grab certain things, but there's still just one tree. And to be honest, devs look, you know, to be fair, they'll often implement one thing with one platform first and then do the other one. But uh, there hasn't really been a speed difference between the two. Some might prefer to do one before the other, but that's about it. But there was no situation when one team breaks code, what if other people are being pulled in too fast? No, no. It's been pretty good. And I mean, it's all, you know, all of our, we put as much as possible in, in Redux. And that's all extensively tested. So there's been fantastic times when we've um, picked up a bug that, that in web, you know, we found a bug in web and fixed it. And it was also happening in iOS. No one knows yet. And so well, it's like, that's the holy grail. Oh my god, we fixed a bug and it worked across both platforms. That is exactly what they wanted. And, it's, and it worked for us. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and you're sort of getting into UX territory there. I mean, there are times when UX, there have been, it's funny, the business really wanted everyone to move faster and they wanted everyone, they supported everyone going to one code base, but there are still elements of the business who want to push one platform forward a little bit more than the other. So we've had to educate them that, no, 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 we can move forward collectively, but we are also, the flip side of that is we are bound together a little bit, okay? So it's kind of rare for, it's, it's kind of rare for the iOS app to display more stuff than the web, you know, the web app usually. I, gu I guess web has the desktop breakpoint, but that's kind of a whole sort of thing in itself. You know, there's there's a little bit of code that, um, for example, reduces or action creators that are might only be used by web or only be used by iOS, but that's pretty uncommon. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yep. No, not yet. So, uh, uh, Sportsbet went to a huge amount of effort to build their own Android app a couple of years ago, and it looks great. It's fantastic. Um, they are not. Uh, they're not up for rewriting that right now. And also, I mean, Android, React Native Android isn't as mature, so we're in no rush. We Honestly, we had enough on our plate <laughs> with, with two platforms, you know, so we held off on Android for now. Yeah, yeah, yep. How was the approval time from the um, Apple? Uh, pretty much the same as it normally is. There's nothing, I can't think of any React Native specific issues. I mean, in theory, you can do you could do tricky stuff like um, loading scripts, like having the iOS app load executable code from a server and stuff like that. And but the problem, if you cheese Apple off, if you do something like that, and they fi and they find out, uh, and you cheese them off, like it's not worth it. It's like it would be devastating. That we've had sometimes we get knocked back because of some little thing. We had a funny thing where we were talking about they mentioned World Cup or something like that in the app. And they got pinned because technically it was it's a, 
it's a, a trademark violation to even talk about World Cup or some, something like that. It was just crazy. And that was enough of a big deal, you know, let alone um, playing chicken with Apple regarding dynamic code downloading or anything like that. So, yeah, just the usual turnaround time. Any other questions? Uh, yep. Uh, as fine-grained as they needed to be. So if, you know, as, if a component ever needed to get something out of state then, or, or dispatch an action to the store, it would have a container. But yeah, you're right, there are some times where we have components without, that are really just a presenter. Not that often though. Um, there's often a container for, yeah, just about everything. Uh, probably got time for one more. Yeah, that's all right. Execution time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so this has been a real thing for the iOS guys. They're really paranoid about this. So, and rightly so, you know, they don't want any degradation in the user experience um, because if there is, management will just take them out the back and flog them. So, th and there are scenarios where the React programming model has, uh, I guess, a bit of an impedance mismatch with the, with the Coco um, programming model. So, things like um, big lists and the way the big lists are handled. and the React Native team have kind of put some things in place to have perf like big performant lists, but even those we found sometimes aren't enough and they've had to, um, the guys at Sportsbed have had to get down and optimise a bit further. They haven't had to, um, so sometimes um, in React Native you just want to do something that you cannot do with JavaScript. Like there were carousels I think, and carousel you can't really do with React Native, so you can, with React Native you can bridge out to a, a, an Objective-C component, and they've done that a bit, but that was more because of just the, it, it just, there was nothing in React Native for that. Performance wise, um, yeah, I w and we had a funny one the other day where, so we have, there's lots of countdown timers in the app, you know, you know, five minutes till this race starts, four minutes, 59 seconds, so on, and so we have this timer that's sort of, transmitting time changes down through the app, like all the time, like every second. And um, it needed to recompute uh, if it was the current day, because they'd, they'd be smartly displayed components. So I might just say, oh, one day to go, and then it might go one hour, 59 minutes, or whatever, you know, it'd sort of have different formats. And computing that actually turned out to be really expensive. And we were really lucky with web, because we didn't notice, because we were using Chrome most of the time, um, and it was just really fast. And, you know, anyway, the, the um, the React Native guys noticed that it was kind of slow because they're forced to use um, Apple's JavaScript engine, which is just not as good as V8, basically. And so they've had to put in um, JavaScript optimizations uh, specifically to deal with the fact that the JavaScript engine that they're going to be running this thing in is not as fast. Um, that's the other bugbear of React Native can be the um, slow startup times because it's just going to parse a giant wad of JavaScript at startup times. Um, but interestingly, the guys, just by putting in a few um, uh, dummy screens, it's not, not a splash screen, but like a dummy screen, like a phased dummy screen, it's actually, it's, it hasn't really phased our users at all, which is really good. So that was a real win, because we were really worried about that. We're like, oh, if this thing's going to sit here for five seconds, that's really bad. Good news is it doesn't, it's only a second or two, and by putting some, some um, skeleton screens in place, people don't really notice. Yeah. Anything else? No? All right, great, thanks very much everybody. Yeah.